Luke 6, verse 12. During those days, he went out to the mountain to pray and spent all night in prayer to God. When daylight came, he summoned his disciples, and he chose twelve of them. He also named them apostles. Simon, whom he also called, named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called the Zealot, Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became the, a traitor. Thank you, Matthew. <clears throat> I want to say how greatly encouraged I am uh, to see everyone here this morning. Uh, and we have a lot of people who are missing, uh, a lot of people who are traveling, as well as people who are out sick. Uh, and I know many of you, including myself, are not uh, exactly feeling the best as well. Uh, but I want to thank you for being here this morning. Uh, and I want to thank all the men for their, their work in the service this morning. Uh, it's very encouraging to see you standing up here, um, you know, exposing yourself, your thoughts, your ideas, uh, your, you know, to really lead us in worship. And I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. This morning, we're going to be doing uh, the first in one of our series for this year. One of our themes is on generosity. And the goal in this theme has not just been to talk about giving more money or more things, that kind of a thing. Although maybe, maybe we will touch upon that. But the goal has been to consider being generous in things like prayer. Being generous in things like our time. And this morning, I want to discuss being generous with our friendship. Now, this morning's lesson, I, I don't actually expect will be uh, very long. I usually hesitate to say that because more often than not, when I, try, when I say something like that, it ends up being the same amount as usual. Uh, but I don't expect this morning's lesson to be very long. Uh, but I want us to understand and to consider how generous Jesus was with his friendship. Because generosity is an attribute of God. God is very generous. He's generous in mercy and loving kindness. He's abundant in many things, you may say. God is very generous. Uh, and I want us to look at this, this fact that Jesus was generous with his friendship. Many cultures throughout time have revered friendship. Uh, so to as many of the ancient Greeks, friendship, love, was the ultimate kind of love. Actually, that's why we have platonic friends, right? Plato was really into this idea of friendship love. And many people today carry this on, I think. For, for many uh, uh, people, depending on where they are uh, geographically in America, uh, for some people, family is very close. I noticed that, of course, when I lived like in the South. Uh, I've noticed it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, maybe amongst some Italians. The family is very close. Um, but for many people, friends are actually much closer. And it would almost be harder to say, this is my friend in Christ, than it would be to say, this is my brother or sister in Christ. It would almost be harder to be taught to, to uh, you know, love, love your friends as yourself, uh, you know, to treat people, your enemies, I should say, as your friends than to treat them as a brother or sister. Because for some of us, we, we maybe don't get along with our family. But if you say to someone, treat your enemy as your friend, I think that puts a different spin on it. And for some people, our friends are much closer than even our families. And a part of this is because we get to choose our friends. We can be very selective in how we pick our friends. Sometimes we're friends uh, because we share similar interests, or similar hobbies. We like the same music. Or sometimes we say this person is not my friend almost as a form of power. That I have the power to say, no, you cannot be my friend. 
And that, that's a great power to wield, by the way, that we, we can do that. It's not, it's not always right to do that, but we can say to people, no, you cannot be my friend. To cut someone out of our lives in that kind of a relationship, if you think about it, really that's what hell is, isn't it? Hell is God saying to certain people, you cannot be in my life. And so we have to be very careful about cutting people out of our lives. Saying to someone, you cannot be my friend. And I want us to look at these 12 apostles here. I asked Matthew to read this passage for us where Jesus picks the 12. Jesus had uh, inner circles and circles within circles where he had his disciples, he had his posse. And then within the disciples, he had the 12 apostles And within the 12 apostles, he really had an inner circle of three, Peter, James, and John, who were exposed to some things that the other apostles didn't get to see. So Jesus had friends, but he also had some friends who were closer than others, which I think is very true for many of us. That for many of us, we certainly have friends, but we have some friends who are closer. And I I want us to know that we are... We're going to a passage to extract principles. So this is not going to be an in-depth, heavy sermon where we look at this passage in an expository way. I know Jesus is picking apostles. He's picking particular people for particular tasks who are going to go out to the, the corners of the earth and going to spread the gospel. So Jesus is picking more than just people to hang out with. I understand that. But these are people Jesus considers friends. In fact, he'll say that in John's gospel, won't he? That he calls them friends from now on. And I want us to look at these people because when you take a closer look, we're not going to be able to look at everyone. And I've named them as Luke names them because if you compare the gospels, you see sometimes they have a little bit of a different name. Um, So I've named them as Luke named them and we're not going to look at all of them. But I want us to look at some of the personalities of these people and how they treated Jesus. Because the more you look at it, and the more you think about it, the more you realize Jesus had every right to say to these people, you're not my friend anymore. And yet he didn't do that. He was very generous with his friendship. So you have here these people who we're going to call Jesus's friends. These 12 apostles. You have Simon Peter, Andrew, James and John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, Simon the Zealot, Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot. Like I said, if you compare the Synoptic Gospels, you'll see that some of these people have different names. Uh, and some of these people, frankly, we, we know almost nothing about. But, so I, I want us to look at some of the people we know a little more about to see the relationship between Jesus and these people who he considered to be his friends. So we're going to start, of course, with Peter. We probably know more about Peter than a lot of these other guys. I want you to take a moment and think about Peter. How did Peter treat Jesus? What was Peter's personality? Was he the kind of person you would want to be a friend with? Some things we know about Peter are, first of all, he's married. If you're Jesus and you're single, are you going to want to be friends with a married person? I know, I know many people who have a hard time being f- single and friends with someone who's married. That alone creates some kind of a barrier for many people. There was a time where Peter pretended not to know Jesus. Remember, Peter denies Jesus three times. In fact, Peter was embarrassed to be known as Jesus' friend. Peter himself probably embarrassed Jesus. I have here from John 18, verses 10 through 12, there's that place where Peter cuts off the ear of Malchus when when they're coming to arrest him. And Jesus tells Peter to put his sword away and he heals the man's ear. That's embarrassing. And Peter also tempted Jesus. In fact, in Matthew 16, 23, the Greek there actually is Jesus saying to Peter, you are a stumbling block to me. Get behind me, Satan. I really want you to consider if you're Jesus, 
would you still be friends with Peter after this? After he's been embarrassed to be around you, after he's embarrassed you publicly in front of people, after he has tempted you and put a stumbling block in your way, would you still be friends with this person? I, I think we stop being friends with people over things much littler than this. And yet that didn't stop Jesus. Jesus still considered Simon Peter to be his friend. So that's Peter. Let's now consider how about James and John. James and John, Jesus himself names them the sons of thunder. I mean, they're not, they're not called this because they're quiet and bashful, right? Would you be friends with someone whose, whose nickname is the Son of Thunder? I mean, these people, James and John, you remember there's a place where they say to Jesus, you want us to call down fire on this village? They went to a village of Samaritans who then rejected them. And they say, do you want us to call down fire and brimstone on these people to destroy them totally? Which, by the way, Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is, is a part of creating people. These are people Jesus himself has created. And they want to destroy them. And of course, Jesus in this passage rebukes them. But I really want you to consider, if you're Jesus and you have, a, you have two people, these brothers who want to destroy something that you created and you love very much, would you still be friends with them? After this, we can move on to Matthew. <clears throat> Matthew, we know, was a tax collector. Matthew himself in his gospel it, when they list the 12 apostles, as we've just read here, only in Matthew's gospel does it say Matthew the tax collector. Matthew gives himself uh, this, um, this title. But I want you to imagine, you do, you, we know what they think about tax collectors. They do not have a high view of tax collectors. Tax collectors uh, were often dishonest. They, they were, in many ways, if not physically, emotionally violent toward people. But have you ever considered that Matthew was a tax collector in the same town where Jesus lived? You think maybe Jesus' family had some kind of run-ins with Matthew when he's collecting taxes? You think maybe Jesus knew people, friends, who had then uh, been, been mistreated by Matthew? And yet Matthew is still considered a friend of Jesus. See, Jesus is very generous with his friendships. He doesn't so quickly cut people out of his lives as sometimes we're tempted to do. After Matthew, how about Thomas? We know Thomas is famous, of course, for doubting that the others had seen Jesus. But you know, just he didn't just doubt that the others had seen Jesus, he also doubted Jesus. Because Jesus had told the apostles that he was going to be put to death and would rise on the third day. And Thomas didn't believe him. Have you ever had people doubt you? It's not a good feeling. And yet Jesus is still friends with Thomas. He's still, because that's the thing about friendship, is family, you can't really pick and choose who your family is. You can choose who your friends are. And I want to be clear that the proverb, in Proverbs, we are taught to be careful about who we choose to be our friends. We have to use wisdom in, in, in picking friends. Bad company corrupts good morals, as Paul writes. But Jesus still extended friendship to Thomas, even though Thomas had doubted him. Even though Thomas had doubted Jesus' other friends. 
after Thomas, you have, how about Simon the Zealot? Now, we don't know much about him, but we actually do know about who the Zealots were. And so I have a passage here from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, which reads this about the Zealots. <clears throat> from the time of the Maccabees, there existed among the Jews a party who professed great zeal for the observance of the law. According to Josephus, they resorted to violence and assassination in their hatred of the foreigner, being at many points similar to the Chinese boxers. It is not improbable that the assassins of Acts 21:38 were identical or at least closely associated with this body of zealots, to which we must conclude that Simon had belonged before he became one of the twelve. So you have someone who, is, who resorts to violence, has assassinated people, because they, they don't observe certain parts of the law. I mean, this is where we get our, our understanding of what a zealot is, a religious zealot. This, this is someone who they say even hates foreigners, puts them to death. And yet Jesus saw in this man a friend. I, th I think that's, that's, I mean, I'm glad that Jesus knows people's hearts. I wouldn't be able to, to see this kind of potential that Jesus can see. But Jesus considers this man a friend. How about, of course, Judas Iscariot? Right, Judas, of course, betrays Jesus. And the thing about a betrayal is that it's, it's, it only hurts when you're close to someone. If you've ever been betrayed by someone you're not close to, I mean, it, it, it's like nothing. The reason Judas' betrayal stung so much is because of how close Jesus was to Judas and how close these other uh, apostles were to Judas. When Jesus said that someone was going to betray him, none of them knew who was going to do it. They didn't suspect Judas. It reminds me of Psalm, uh, Psalm 55, uh, verses 12 through 14 here. For it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend, we used to take sweet counsel together. Within God's house, we walked in the throng. Jesus chose this man as his friend, knowing that Jesus was going to be hurt in the end because of it. Sometimes we don't want to get close to people because we're afraid of getting hurt. Isn't that true? And yet that didn't stop Jesus. He was generous with his friendship. He generously called people friends, called them his close associates, his companions, people who, who embarrassed him, people who tried to destroy the things he created, people who, who had a past of, of, of violence, like Simon the Zealot, people who doubted him, people who betrayed him. And that never stopped Jesus from calling these people his friends. Jesus generously extended his friendship to all these people. And I think this is one form of generosity that will do all of us a lot of good. To be generous in our friendships. To be willing to be hurt to be willing to be friends with people who maybe have doubted us, mistreated us, who have, who have pasts that make us uncomfortable, to be willing to draw close to these people and to call them our friends. So how did Jesus teach us to treat our friends? I actually would like you to consider later on in Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 36. <clears throat> If you're reading Luke's gospel, this all appears to be happening at the same time. We're in verse 12, in ver or excuse me, chapter 6, verse 12. We read, In these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. When day came, he called his disciples. 
Then you have verse 17, and he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem. So then you have all these people, and then Jesus starts teaching them. It appears to be one event that's happening. But Jesus here teaches us and his disciples, really, how to treat our enemies. But, but the truth is, it's not always our enemies who fall into these categories, is it? I mean, consider verses 27 through 31. Jesus says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, to one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Don't our friends sometimes act this way? I mean, verse 30, give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. Do you know how many movies I've lost to friends? I've loaned them out and just never gotten them back. Sometimes our friends fall into this category. I think Jesus did that. Didn't Jesus pray for those who abused him when he prayed for Peter when Peter denied him? You know, just before Peter denies Jesus, Jesus says, Peter, I have prayed for you. If you were here on Wednesday, Wednesday evening in our class, we talked about that. And isn't that exactly what Jesus did? He prayed for those who abused him. Peter abused him. He denied him. He was embarrassed to be seen with him. And yet Jesus prayed for him. Didn't Jesus do good to those who hated him? Which is exactly what he says here. When he went to the cross for every apostle who slept while Jesus was in agony and then abandoned him. You remember in the garden, Jesus goes and he's praying. He's in a great agony, Luke says. And the apostles, they're just sleeping. Even when try, Jesus tries to get them to stay awake, they're just sleeping. And then, of course, we read that they scatter. They abandon him. And isn't that a kind of hating someone? Really, those are, those are actions of hatred. It doesn't have to be the emotion. Really, it's an action of hatred. And yet Jesus did good to them by going to the cross anyway. Because the truth is that sometimes our friends act like enemies. And that's just a part of, it's just a part of being alive. But Jesus, I think, sets a great example for us to be generous with our friendships. I'd like us to reread these next following verses, verses 32 through 36, with friendship in mind. Let's read it first as it is. Start at Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 32, Jesus says, If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Let's reread this with, with friendship in mind. So verse 32 I think could easily be reread. If you're friends with those who are like you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners are friends with those who are like them. That's often how we pick friends, isn't it? The people who are most like us. But really, what benefit is that to us? You're just around people who are more the same. And you don't, you don't see how God has worked in someone else's life. Or the changes another person has made in their lives because of what God has done for them and that you, you can learn from. You just, you miss out on so much when you're only around people who are like you. Verse 33, we could reread it as, if you're a good friend to those who are a good friend to you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. 
Is that what we sometimes think? I'll be a good friend to someone as long as they're a good friend to me. And yet we just saw these people were not good friends to Jesus. These people really mistreated him at times. Or verse 34, <clears throat> I think we could reread it as, if you give your friendship to those from whom you expect to receive friendship, what credit is that to you? Jesus extended his friendship even to Judas. Judas did not give that back. Verse 35, we could reread as, Love your friends and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and you will be sons of the Most High. In verse 35 there, he tells us why these kinds of people are sons of the Most High. He says, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Because being mistreated is a part of what it means to be God. Most people don't like God. And they don't consider God a friend. Most people do very evil things and yet demand the world from God. And God endures it. But if we're only friends to those from whom we expect to receive friendship? I mean, are we really looking out for someone else's best interests, or do we just want another friend? Jesus was generous with his friendships, and we should be too. Because the, the truth is, we're training to be like Jesus. If you look in verse 40, just a little bit later in this exact same sermon, Jesus says, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. That, I only have one verse in my whole Bible that's highlighted, and it's this verse. If we're not generous with our friendships, it's not because we're more advanced. It's because we're not yet fully trained. We're not trained to be like Jesus in this world. Being generous is an attribute of God, and it's an attribute that we're to take on as well. And one way I encourage us all to be generous throughout our lives and throughout the rest of this week is to be generous with our friendships. To be willing to be friends with people we, we wouldn't normally be friends with. To draw close to people we wouldn't, draw, we wouldn't normally draw close to. To be willing to be friends with people who may have uh, doubted us, who may have hurt us, who may have unseemly backgrounds, to be friends with people who the world would say you shouldn't be a friend with, but who God considers to be a friend. At this time, we offer an invitation. This is an invitation to be baptized into the body of Christ, to be called a disciple. This is an invitation for prayers. If you, if you need prayers, this is an invitation to study. If you'd like to study, if you have any questions, if there's anything at all that the church can do for you, we ask that you would make your need known now while we stand and sing the invitation song.